Over to Chloe and welcome to Health in Europe. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, uh, so I'm very happy. Uh, I don't see the screen anymore. It's gone on my side. <laughs> um, yeah. Is that it? Okay, per yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so yes, I, I was saying I'm very happy to be here to present my research. So thanks everyone for, for being here. And thanks a lot, Mary, for all your work on the organization of the sessions, uh, which are always uh, very interesting for me. So uh, what I'm going to present here are the main results of my PhD thesis. Uh, which I defended in, in um, December uh, 2020. And then I would like also to tell you a bit about um, the latest development in e-health uh, since the beginning of the COVID crisis. So uh, first, uh, let's begin with the PhD thesis. So as you can guess from the title of my presentation, the use of EU soft law in the making of domestic e-health policies. Uh, uh, I was in this PhD uh, thesis really interested in exploring exploring Europeanization processes in the area of ES or electronic health, uh, which refers to devices in healthcare in which information and communication technologies are integrated. Um, so Mary, maybe you can click to the next slide, please. Um, so you can have um, uh, many devices in e-health. Um, the first ones are electronic health records, uh, EHR. Um, so I, I put them on the left. In France, for instance, we have the uh, Dossier Medical Personnel, uh, which is a DMP. ELGA is the Austrian uh, version of the electronic health record. Um, the DEP is a Swiss version of the electronic health record. Um, so Often, these electronic health records are the main uh, building block, I mean, the first building block of EHS policies. Um, and they are very uh, important for the member states uh, who have generally spent over the last years uh, a lot of resources uh, in developing these records. And they, they can uh, really affect uh, deeply the coordination between health professionals. Uh, but it's not the only uh, device uh, in EHS uh, that exists. For instance, you can also have uh, telemedicine uh, consultations. So I don't know uh, in every country, but in France, uh, these devices uh, were not really used, at least before the, the COVID crisis. And you can also have, uh, for instance, uh, e-health booths uh, in which the patient uh, can use the ex examination tools uh, himself or herself while being connected uh, with a health professional. Um, for the rest of the presentation, I will mainly focus on electronic health records um, because, as I said, they are the first building block of, uh, of EHS policies and um, they have quite a, a long uh, history of development uh, in member states. And so uh, what is interesting, so maybe, Mary, you can click on the next uh, slide, please. Uh, uh, is that the EU has developed a lot of uh, soft instruments in e-health. Uh, so why soft instruments? Of course, because e-health is part of uh, SK organization, which remains uh, member states' competence. And so here are the main uh, EU instruments uh, developed in soft law. Uh, so uh, in a very simplified way, three main periods can be identified. Um, so the first one is in the, in the 90s. So here the main EU uh, instruments in eHealth are the funding of eHealth research projects, uh, mainly through uh, framework programs for research and innovation, but also through um, sometimes collabora collaboration with the European Space Agency. Um, and then you have a change at the beginning of the, the years to because uh, at this time, the European Commission begins to uh, produce very soft uh, political instruments, which are mainly communications and uh, recommendations. So, for instance, you can find uh, eHealth in the Europe um, Action Plan in 2002 and in 2005. Uh, the European Commission publishes in 2004 its eHealth Action Plan, which mainly encourages member states to uh, invest and develop uh, e-health policies. And, uh, in 2008, you have uh, two communications on uh, interoperability and telemedicine. In 2009, the European Council's conclusion on e-health. In 2010, the digital agenda for Europe. Um, 
And then we can identify a, a third uh, period, uh, which begins uh, uh, roughly in, in 2011 with the uh, inclusion of e-health uh, in the 2011 cross-border healthcare directive. So, of course, even if it's in the directi directive, uh, e-health uh, still remains uh, 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 um, based on a, on a voluntary uh, basis. So it's a bit soft law uh, within hard law. Uh, but from then, you have the creation of the e-health networks, which gathers the public authorities in charge of e-health at the domestic level. And these networks um, sort of adopts uh, many guidelines in order to, um, to make uh, e-health devices compatible, uh, which we say uh, interoperable. Um, so the idea is really uh, uh, that the patient uh, can uh, move across the border uh, with his or her health data. And so you have guidelines, for instance, to exchange and uh, translate uh, patient summaries, which are the some kind of summaries of the main uh, information uh, that you can have in a, an electronic health record. Uh, and you have the same, for instance, for e-prescriptions. And uh, from the 2015-2016, uh, there was a, a sort of um, harder enforcement of the software uh, because, for instance, you had the Connecting Europe facilities project in which the member states uh, really engaged um, in, a, in a project so with money in order to create the, the concrete infrastructures uh, to uh, allow for this exchange uh, of e uh, prescri prescription and uh, patient summaries. And so they really had to, to, to build uh, the infrastructures to do so and of course to apply the guidelines uh, which were adopted in the EHAS network. Uh, and so uh, what is interesting um, is that we observe that the majority of member states have developed uh, EHAS strategies precisely at the beginning and in the middle of the years 2000. So maybe, Marie, you can click and you can see a circle appearing. Yes, perfect. So uh, hence the, the aim of the research, uh, which was to examine uh, the link or the absence of link, of course, uh, between European and domestic initiatives. Uh, so, uh, Marie, you can click for the ne next sli slide, please. So, I will uh, say a few uh, words uh, about the general approach. Um, so, very generally, um, in this page, this I focus on uh, UU usage. So, which refers to uh, the use of European instruments uh, by uh, domestic actors when they realize their domestic political work. So I don't really look at uh, the, all the interactions between um, European and domestic actors at the European level. I only look at what actors do with European instruments once they are uh, really realizing some policy actions at the domestic level. Uh, also, uh, I had to find a way to um, map uh, precisely the influence of these uh, uses of the EU at the domestic level. And for this, I used the Multiple Streams Framework, uh, which was initially developed by John Kingdon in 1984. Uh, so I will tell a bit more about this later. Um, and then I, I, uh, I based my research on a comparative and qualitative analysis of um, three uh, most similar cases, so France, Austria, and Ireland, uh, which were cases in which um, um, weak uh, usage of the EU uh, was uh, expected in general. And for the method, uh, I used quite classical method in, in, uh, in the comparative analysis of a small number of cases, which are the, the covariation method and the process tracing method. Um, as regards the data, I conducted about uh, 70 uh, semi-structured interviews with uh, many policy actors uh, and uh, document analysis of those policy documents, reports, uh, internal correspondence, and so on. Uh, and so what I'm going to, to show you now, so Marina, you can click for the next slide, please, uh, is a sort of synthesis of the main result of my PhD thesis. Uh, so uh, 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 a small a short word about this graph, because uh, I don't know if a lot of 
you know, know King Dunn's book. Uh, so I, I used this logic and I had to modify it a bit to adapt it to the stages of the policy making process. Um, so mainly the, the basic idea in King Dunn's uh, multiple streams framework is that you have three streams which are three uh, independent dynamics. So you have the politics stream, the problems stream, and the solution, solution stream, sorry. And from time to time, a window of uh, opportunity uh, opens, and then uh, a skillful policy entrepreneur um, uh, joins the streams together uh, during this window's opportunity. And this results in the agenda setting of a public policy. Um, so here in this, uh, in this graph, the logic is really the same. Um, the, the converging periods are the areas in gray, and then you have the, the streams periods, uh, which are called in the thesis the flux periods, uh, which just um, keep going after this first uh, agenda setting uh, period. So in the policy formation process, then in the decision process, and then in the implementation process. And uh, the idea is that you can have a use, uh, uses of the EU in either of the streams during any stage of the policy making. Uh, I also identified three types of usage uh, based on their rational, rational, sorry. Uh, so technical based usage uh, refers to the use of the EU when it is considered useful for uh, accomplishing a concrete activity and as having a, a sort of an added value compared to the domestic level. Uh, then you can have legitimacy, legitimacy based usage uh, in which the use of the EU uh, is not much motivated by the fact that it is seen as useful in practice, but rather by the idea that the EU should have a say or not in how the sector under analysis operates. Uh, and then the third type of usage is the allocation-based one. And in this uh, case, it does not matter whether the EU is perceived as useful or legitimate, uh, because it is rather seen as an element disrupting the previous state of domestic resource allocation. Uh, so that's for the, the three types of, uh, of usage. Um, of course, the idea uh, then was not just to map uh, the influence of the EU on domestic politics and policies, but also to explain the appearance of these uses of the EU. So uh, here I, uh, you can see that there are in the thesis uh, about 11 cases of EU uh, usage that, that are uh, presented, uh, I will present it some. I will present some of them in the following um, slides. Um, and so, yes, in the thesis, I explored three hypotheses in order to explain the variations in your usage in the three cases. So maybe Mary, you can click on the next slide, please. So, um, yeah. Ah, no, yes, first hypothesis, perfect. Thank you very much. So. interest and resources and the idea uh, is that you really need to understand the situation of an actor and not just to focus on the fit or the misfit between uh, EU, uh, European and domestic models in order to expand European Europeanization processes which is often the case in uh, Europeanization uh, studies um, and so for instance the, this notion of taking into account actors' interests allows to explain why, at about the same period of time, Irish and French actors use European guidelines in order to create their e-health standards, whereas Austrian actors do not. So, uh, in France, in the process of making the national standards for patient summaries, um, the Haute Autorité de Santé, so the, the French National Authority for, for Health, used European guidelines, mainly to inform uh, the, the policy formation process. We find the same thing in Ireland, in which very often EU standards are the basis on which the national standards are built. But in the Austrian case, I could not find such uses, despite uh, Austrian actors being very connected to the international level. And so a good explanation for this was that in Austria, um, they have a very important technical community which is specialized in health standards and which is entirely integrated 
fitted to the decision making process. And so they do not need to rely on international standards to build their own domestic standards. Uh, this was not the case in France and in Ireland, where the people in charge of making the standards were far less specialized and didn't have the skills to create standards from scratch, from, uh, sorry, from scratch, and then had to rely on international examples, uh, such as the European ones in this case. So, of course, what interests and resources mean changes a lot depending on the context, uh, but I explored this throughout the, the thesis, always by using a systematic comparison between the three states. And what I found uh, was that this variable uh, really needs to be taken into account to understand uh, Europeanization processes. Um, so, Mary, maybe you can click on the next slide, please. So, uh, the, the second hypothesis is. Uh, is related to um, the relation of a country uh, to the European Union. So it's quite a classical hypothesis uh, in the usage literature, um, but I wanted to explore its precise uh, effects on, uh, on EU usage. And what I found uh, is that this re relationship to the EU is likely to affect the, the place of EU usage uh, on the graph. So in the cases under study, I had two uh, different configurations. Either EU usage occurred during converging uh, periods and during what I called flux period. So, Marie, maybe you can click and you will see a circle appear. Yes, perfect, thank you. Um, either, in the French case, EU usage occurred mainly uh, within flux periods. And uh, maybe you can click, Marie, again to see the third circle. Ah, no. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and, and these results uh, appeared to be consistent uh, with the relationship towards the EU of each country, with Ireland presenting the more positive attitude, France the more negative one, if we can say so, and Austria was more an ambivalent and mixed case uh, on this regard. And so this consistency can be explained by the fact that converging periods um, are generally Already quite visible publicly and involve uh, elected officials. So, if an actor wants to uh, realize uh, a use of the EU during this type of period, it will certainly be important important for him or her to know that there is a general good perception of the EU in the wider environment. Um, on the contrary, during uh, flux periods, uses of the EU can be realized in very small communities of policy actors, which means that no matter how is the global relationships towards the EU, people will only have to rely on their personal experience to know whether their use of the EU will be well perceived or not. And so, for instance, uh, in Austria, um, in, in 2004, the EU e-health action plan was really used by the Minister of Health and the Ministry of Health in general uh, to convince to convince e-health actors to engage uh, in the Ministry of Health uh, e-health initiative. So, really, uh, the, 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 the Ministry of Health said, said to this wide community of e-health actors, uh, the European Commission uh, asked us to, to create um, a national strategy for e-health uh, by 2005. So, uh, really, we need you to do this. And this was really used as an argument to, to, um, to get all the players to sit at a table and, and to work on this strategy. So, it was quite public uh, and involved, uh, really, the political actors within the, the ministry. Uh, in Ireland, so the case of course is different, but there is also an involvement of, of uh, the minister themselves and of the, the public. Um, so the 2004 and the 2013 Irish EU presidencies were really used um, as a way to, to show how uh, domestic initiatives in e-health and European initiatives in e-health were really uh, congruent. And so at, at these two times, and these two periods of times, uh, really, we can see uh, um, a sort of revival of, of uh, the work around e-health in this country. And so in 2004 and 2013, uh, you had the EU uh, 
Irish presidency, which resulted in the adoption uh, in the same year of two uh, national e-health strategies. So in Ireland, there is really this connection, this temporal connection between European, uh, the European level and and um, and uh, Irish uh, e-health initiatives. And what was interesting also is that uh, with the 2008 bailout plan, so with the crisis and so on, there was really no no money to invest. Uh, uh, in the health system, uh, but there was a civil servant within the Ministry of Health uh, who uh, engaged some discussion with the European Commission uh, and asked them to include e-health in the bailout uh, plan. And actually, that's why uh, in Ireland they uh, managed to adopt the health identifier bill in 2013, and that's also why e-health was put on the very top of the agenda uh, during the 2013 uh, Irish uh, EU presidency. Uh, so once again, these initiatives were uh, very public, publicly visible and also involved uh, elected officials. Uh, on the contrary, uh, in France, uh, uses of the EU mainly occurred within small groups uh, of civil servants. Uh, so, for instance, uh, in the late uh, 2000s, uh, you had the, um, a small unit in charge of uh, e-health and in charge of the electronic cash record, and the director had the specific uh, conceptualization of the of the French electronic health record. Um, and then you had this person who was really um, managing this relationship uh, between the domestic and the European level and uh, she said to this director if we keep this conceptualization of the French electronic cash record uh, we won't be able to engage in uh, later uh, European developments and so this discussion which was really between just two uh, civil servants uh, led the director to change uh, the way uh, he conceived the, the French electronic health record so uh, here you had a, a sort of transformation of the policy solution, but it was not really visible publicly and it didn't actually involve any uh, public official. So uh, that's why that was for the main effect of the relation of a country to the European Union, uh, as far as I could see in the PhD uh, thesis. And so now I, I will talk about the third hypothesis. So, uh, Marie, please, you can change the, the slide. And so the third hypothesis is about the changing nature of EU soft law. Um, and so when you look at the difference between countries, uh, we observe that uh, Austria uh, only displays one type of usage, which is a legitimacy-based usage. So maybe, Marie, you can click three times and there will be three circles appearing. Yes, in the last one. Um, Whereas, uh, by, by contrast, uh, France and Ireland present cases of the three types of usage. So now you can click two times, I guess. Perfect, thank you. And, and so first, we, we can think of this as a difference between countries. Uh, but if you add the temporal dimension to the equation, equation, then you realize that there is a distribution of EU usage, which is uh, temporarily similar in all the three cases. Uh, and so that's what we can see uh, on the table on the right. Um, so what we can see is that during the first period, period up until 2010, um, in Ireland, Austria or France, we can only observe legitimacy-based usage. Uh, whereas from 2011, all types of, of usage are appearing, uh, except in Austria, uh, in which there is no usage, but because uh, of other reasons which are related to the first hypothesis, so resource uh, and interest of actors. Anyway, uh, and uh, it appears also that this uh, temporal distribution is also congruent with the type of EU instrument uh, that I described it, that I described it earlier. So I won't get too much into the details, but the idea is that the more uh, the EU instrument is uh, both complex and hard, even if it remains uh, soft law, of course, the more it is likely for technical and alloc allocation-based usage to appear. 
Um, the idea is that for legitimacy based usage to appear, you only need to have uh, a, a, a small formalization of a political position at the EU level, and it's enough for uh, leg legitimacy based usage to appear. Um, so that was for the third hypothesis. And to conclude, so maybe. Uh, Marie, you can uh, click on the next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to uh, to 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 uh, give you some remarks about uh, the the COVID nineteen crisis, which of course uh, changed everything in this area. And so the COVID nineteen crisis has been a very interesting period for e health, mainly because um, the fact that the EU is able to create, for instance, the e health network and to create guidelines on e health is mainly linked uh, to its freedom of uh, movement competence. And actually, the main argument is that if citizens are to move freely across the EU, then they need to have access to their health data uh, wherever they are. And most of the time, this link between health and mobility is not very salient, except maybe for cross-border regions or for a small part of the populations uh, that travels a lot in a lot of different countries. But obviously, with the pandemic, this link between health and freedom of movement uh, became extremely relevant for the policy making processes at the EU level, uh, but also at the domestic one. So first, regarding contact tracing applications, uh, it was underlined very early in the debate that uh, these applications had to rely on the same uh, system design, centralized or decentralized, uh, if they were meant to be compatible or interoperable at a European scale. And so at the beginning, uh, the there was a sort of consensus uh, between France and Germany on a centralized design, but then Ch Germany changed, and with it, most European countries decided to adopt decentralized uh, applications, but not France, uh, nor Hungary and the Slovak uh, Republic, but uh, the, just the, the three of them. And so actually, the, the changes for the French uh, application to Santé Covid to be compatible with other European applications is very, very small. Uh, but what was interesting is that uh, we could saw during the, this debate that the European Union uh, really became a, a crucial dimension of the debate. And uh, now that vaccinations are in progress uh, everywhere, there are currently very intense discussions about uh, digital or electronic certification. So it's a, it's a green, uh, green certificate, I think the name. So uh, the eHealth network has been in a very intense activity since the beginning of the crisis, and uh, it has now developed guidelines. So as I said, for contact tracing applications, but also for vaccination and test certificates. So from what I understood, uh, the issue right now is that the European Commission would like for every EU citizen with a European certificate to be able to travel anywhere in the EU. But of course, member states want to keep the control of the borders. So anyway, even if member states uh, keep uh, this control in the end, is it like it's likely that producing and receiving certificates from any country of the EU becomes in any way mandatory? Uh, or I guess it, it would be a case of discrimination or something like this. So in the end, uh, it is very likely um, that the design of uh, immuni immunization or test certificates will be decided uh, and uh, mandatory at the European level, despite it has been a competence of member states. But at the same time, uh, some countries, uh, I know at least that France has now created a digital certificate just last week, uh, so which is available on uh, Tous Anti Covid. Uh, I actually have no idea if it's compliant or not with the EHAS Network's uh, guidelines on the matter. Uh, but anyway, compatibility might be uh, easier to achieve than for contact tracing applications uh, because uh, it's possible to use only a QR code, uh, which is like the first level of dig digitalization um, that you can have with barcodes, for instance. So anyway, I would have like uh, very much to, to do my research field uh, right now because uh, it's, I think it's very interesting, yeah. um, but it is what it is. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and it's over. <laughs>